by way of introduction, let me say, uh, when I'm asked about what the center's role is, I have three different answers depending on who I'm talking to. Uh, if I'm talking inside the, the technical community, uh, the laboratory world, I talk about the role of the center as a bridge between the technical community and the policy community and making sure that there's a nice two-way flow of information and context. Uh, if I'm talking to the larger uh, policy analysis community, I talk about uh, the need to move on intellectually from the transition period at the end of the Cold War with our focus on cooperative threat reduction, uh, onto, onto the new intellectual and policy challenges of assurance, deterrence, and strategic stability in the, in the context of new forms of conflict in the 21st century. Uh, and if I'm talking to family at the dinner table, uh, I, I say, uh, well, I, I'm, we're, we're in the business of, of strategic fluency. We're, we're trying to, to put on the table ideas, uh, vocabulary, lines of argument uh, to, to wrestle with, uh, to, to that, that are aligned with the world we live in today as opposed to the world that, that looms over us so clearly from the Cold War. Uh, so three different ways of explaining the role of the center, which is part of the reason I've been trying to get Jim Miller to come uh, and talk to us for, for a year or two, uh, because these, these are also three ways to explain Jim's role in, uh, in, in our community. Uh, and uh, he, he is, uh, as, a, as a member of the Defense Science Board, uh, that's an illustration of the, the depth of technical skill he, as a policy person, uh, brings, brings to the topics uh, that he's been working on. Uh, he's done a lot of important concept development, uh, in including um, some of you may have seen the work that was released uh, uh, last week on uh, U.S.-Russia strategic stability in a sort of multi-domain context. Uh, you might also be familiar with the work that he, he co-led for the Defense Science Board on cybersecurity and um, I don't think deterrence was in the title. Was, it was. It was in the title. Well done. Uh, so uh, all, these themes come together today in the in the talk he'll be giving. Uh, you know the title, but to review: adapting the U.S. approach to strategic deterrence to address rapid and accelerating technological change. Uh, Jim, as you know from the the invitation, as president and CEO of Adaptive Strategies. Uh, he, ser he served in multiple positions in the Department of Defense, including most recently as Under Secretary of Defense for Policy. As I mentioned, he's a member of the Defense Science Board, uh, and he's here in the Bay Area primarily because he's a tennis player. Uh, and uh, uh, our rules of engagement this morning, uh, this is an unclassified discussion, as always here at CGSR. Uh, Jim will talk for approximately 45 minutes to lay some ideas on the table, and then then the cameras will stop rolling uh, and we'll go to Q&A and when we get there, please wait for the microphone to get to you so that the whole room can hear what you have to say. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Jim Miller. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Let's see if the mic has gone hot. Are you hearing me in the back? Ron, you're my test. Uh, okay, great, that's excellent. Uh, Brad, thank you for that very kind introduction. It's great to be here today. Uh, uh, and I've wanted to come for the last year or two. I'm glad it finally worked out. Uh, it did turn out to be convenient to Stanford thumping USC in tennis on Friday <laughs> and thumping UCLA in tennis yesterday, uh, but that was only a, uh, only a part of the visit for sure. Uh, congrats to the Eagles fans, condolences to the Patriots fans, uh, and you know, next year or sometime soon thereafter for the Niners and Raiders fans as well. Um, <laughs> And it's great to be here with so many you know, incredibly talented people and you know, uh, Brad with whom I worked very closely obviously in the Pentagon and, and prior, and Michael Macht with whom I also had the honor to work closely. And Ron, I don't know if you even remember this, but one of the first times I interacted with you, I was set up to debate you on nuclear testing and talk about a thumping. That's what I got on that topic at the time. Um, this was back, this was perhaps 1982-83. Um, but, I mean, it's great to be here uh, and, uh, and really good timing, in a sense, for the, the set of topics as we come a few days after the administration released its nuclear post review and uh, about two weeks after it re uh, released its national security strategy. I won't focus on the nuclear posture review in the presentation today, 
but I'd welcome any questions uh, on that topic as well. Uh, and I'll just note, as, uh, as we were talking about earlier, uh, uh, as Brad and I were talking about earlier, I see a lot of continuity in this nuclear posture review with the, not just the 2010, but prior reviews, and I see appropriate change as well. Uh, but what I want to talk about today is different change, uh, and that's how, as Brad noted, how the impact of emerging military capabilities based on some of today's technologies and some technologies that are just coming to the fore, including directed energy, are likely to change the basis of strategic stability, particularly with respect to U.S. Russia and U.S. China. I'll say a little bit about North Korea and a little bit about Iran as well. Um, bless you. I, and I do need to say uh, I'm speaking for myself today, not for any of the organizations with which I'm affiliated, including the Defense Science Board. Uh, and I will be drawing from the work that you, uh, that you mentioned, uh, co-authored papers with Richard Fontaine as well as Defense Science Board Study and, and others. Uh, and it will be unclassified. So the talk today will have two parts. The first part is really problem definition, description. And I will make the case that emerging military capabilities related to cyberspace, outer space, including counter space capabilities, long range strike, missile defense, and a broad category that I will call AI, but can be also uh, uh, described as having multiple parts, including data sciences and autonomous systems and so on, that these are changing the, the dynamics of escalation of, uh, from peacetime to conflict, of escalation within conflict, and potentially of escalation from conventional to nuclear war. Uh, and part two is uh, some initial thinking about steps that we should take to deal with these challenges. And my belief is that for most of these challenges, we're going to see, uh, if not exponential growth, significant growth in the coming years and decades, and, but that we have an opportunity to get ahead of those rising challenges, much as, for example, Albert Wolstetter's work on, this, uh, on, the, on the bomber basing study back in the, in the 50s, in the early 50s, really got ahead of the missile threat to our bombers in Europe and the United States and helped us have a more survivable posture. Okay, so some important context for part one, the nature of the problem. Um, as Jim Mattis noted as he rolled out the national security strategy, strategy just uh, less than two weeks ago, the U.S. is working hard to establish conventional military supremacy relative to all potential adversaries, including specifically to Russia and China. That was part of the last administration's policy. It was not a, a new move. Being explicit about that with respect to Russia and China is something that's relatively new. But this, whether it's called third offset or whether it has another label or no label, this is a longstanding part of U.S. military uh, policy. Uh, and what's new is not the, this aspiration, but what's new is the tools that are being brought to bear to support it. <clears throat> um, as we pursue this set of military uh, capabilities, or this new multiple sets of military capabilities, we need to recognize that China and Russia in particular are also pursuing not exactly the same, but, but similar and overlapping capabilities. And that's entirely reasonable on their behalf. Um, and here's the issue, uh, and it comes, I think, as no surprise to people in this room. And that is, as the US and China and Russia pursue these technologies, including within military tech, uh, capabilities, uh, leveraging cyberspace, including offensive cyber, outer space, including counter space capabilities, long range strike, including prompt global strike, missile defense, including in future the potential for hundreds of uh, relatively capable interceptors, as well as directed energy systems, and AI, we're likely to do three interrelated things or see three inter interrelated effects. First, we'll see the creation of slippery slopes from peacetime to gray zone to crisis to conflict and the escalation of conflict. Second, we'll see the erosion of fire breaks, specifically fire breaks between conventional and nuclear and between so-called theater and strategic attacks. And I'll say more about, about that, of course. And third and most broadly, we'll see an undermining of the uh, st the strategic stability associated with the nuclear balance and more broadly associated with um, the balance between U.S., Russia, U.S., China. So I'm going to spend some time on each of those, uh, slippery slopes, fire breaks, and strategic stability. 
And if I end up running short on recommendations, I'll, uh, I'll refer you to the, the, the report I did with Richard Fontaine for, for many of them and just hit some high level key points. But I think that uh, if you don't buy the problem diagnosis, you're not gonna buy any of the solutions. So I wanna, I wanna spend time on that, that diagnosis in particular. Okay, so first on problem definition, slippery slopes. So, so I see three specific new dynamics that are going to increasingly uh, create the possibility for rapid and often unintended escalation uh, from crisis to conflict and within conflict. Um, first, of course, war could start in cyberspace or outer space and spread from there. Um, U.S. has suffered uh, cyber attacks from multiple countries. 2012-2013, uh, uh, Iran conducted distributed denial of service attacks on the U.S. banking sector. In 2014, North Korea uh, conducted its cyber attack on Sony Entertainment. China's massive theft of intellectual property through cyberspace. Russia's hack of the U.S. elections in 2016. Uh, which were more extensive than originally thought. So for cyberspace, in some sense, game, it's, it's game on, not, not for the full set of potential capabilities being applied, uh, but understand that within the gray zone or whatever you wish to call it, it's game on. And of course, something I hardly need to tell this audience, because of the U.S. militaries and to significant degree, both Russia and China, Chinese military's significant reliance on information technology and networks uh, including cyberspace and as it interacts with outer space, um, going after the other side's information technology capabilities, whether in its command and control systems or embedded in its plant platforms and other systems, is going to be uh, an incredibly attractive approach uh, uh, going forward in conflict. And in order to do that, particularly in cyberspace, but also significantly in outer space, in order to have offensive potential that could be valuable for boosted deterrence or for coercion, one needs to have a presence and a set of capabilities during peacetime. And that includes having a presence on the other side's uh, networks. Uh, we've, of course, seen other penetrations of the U.S. Uh, civilian critical infrastructure, including on the energy side. So we're headed into a world, and you can judge, are we in it now or are we going to be in it soon? We're headed into a world where each major power has significant capabilities, uh, in, uh, including cyber implants in peacetime in the other side's infrastructure, supporting military operations and supporting critical civilian functions. Okay, um, the extent to which that is true in the future in space is, is currently open to a, a little bit of discussion and debate, but it's, it, it will be um, non-zero. Um, so, a world in which each side has and needs embeds in the other side's critical infrastructure and military systems and, uh, uh, and where that happens in peacetime. In this world, <coughs> cyberspace in particular is virtually doused with gasoline and a small spark of a cyber attack could start a conflagration. The spark could come from a cyber attack that was intended to be localized but that propagated it could be started by lower level unauthorized personnel. It could be started by proxies or cyber mercenaries. It could be started by false flag attacks that were conducted by another nation wishing to see escalation between the US and another party. The situation in outer space appears somewhat less flammable, no pun intended given the lack of oxygen uh, than cyberspace, but it's increasingly primed for conflict as well. Uh, and it is clear, as we've seen in recent public statements uh, by the United States, including in strategy documents, that China and Russia are both pursuing some, el some elements and types of counter space capabilities. I'm not suggesting that they're doing something either illegal or morally wrong or astrategic. It's just the world that we need to be prepared for. Um, and in outer space, uh, in addition to the, po uh, the potential for intentional attack, you have the possibility of collision of, of, a, of a mechanical or electronic failure that is due to the system, not due to attack, and the potential for inadvertent conflict, I, I believe, is, is substantially growing over time. Okay. Um, uh, it, if, if, you're, if you are, I guess, on the West Coast, or particularly if you're in Hawaii, the idea that there could be a false attack, or I'm sorry, a false warning of missile attack seems relatively plausible, uh, you know, based on uh, experience of a couple weeks. So one is 
so one is this, this idea that uh, uh, for slippery slopes, this idea that it could happen inadvertently yeah, for a number of reasons. Second, if armed conflict looks at all likely, each side is going to have very strong incentives to go early and big in cyberspace and outer space, particularly cyberspace, but also uh, for non-kinetic attacks in, in outer space. They offer the possibility to degrade the other side's command and control, to slow its movement of forces, disrupt its logistics, to make its precision strikes less precise, uh, and generally to make its employment of military force and therefore its coercive ability less compelling and effective. Uh, if these early attacks succeed, the attacker gains advantage, possibly without creating any direct casualties. Uh, and the question that an attacker might ask is, well, if I go in cyber and space early, is the other side really going to escalate with conventional, let alone nuclear, uh, because they have some fried computers and do dead robots in outer space. It's going to look like a high leverage, low risk move uh, early, in, early in conflict, if not, if not in crisis. Um, and uh, given the challenges of attrib attributing cyber and potentially space attacks as well, uh, it may have, uh, an attacker may believe they buy time as attribution is sorted through as well. And third, still in the slippery slope category, um, uh, and this is the most speculative of the three elements of slippery slope. Um, to the extent that the attack side sees disadvantage in the potential for growing attacks in cyberspace and outer space, there may be incentives to, to, to go ahead and escalate, particularly if they believe that they have, uh, the, the, uh, if that they're facing use or lose uh, dynamics uh, with respect to their military capabilities. And the fact that both conventional and nuclear systems rely on IT extensively just uh, boosts this problem. Okay, so we're looking at slippery slope escalation dynamics that are greater than what we have today and greater than what we've been used to uh, in the past, including the Cold War, um, uh, uh, in my estimation. And the second uh, part of the problem definition is the erosion of fire breaks. And again, during the Cold War and since, we've had I think two key fire breaks. One is between conventional and nuclear systems. Second, between so-called theater and strategic systems or strategic attacks. These fire breaks haven't made nuclear attack on the United States or strategic attack on the United States impossible, but they've raised, uh, uh, they've raised the difficulty or they've raised the, uh, uh, the, the challenge associated with doing that and, uh, to some degree, and they have made less likely stumbling into uh, strategic attack or nuclear attack. Uh, we're facing erosion in four distinct ways. First, um, and most obviously perhaps, cyber attacks on U.S. military systems, let alone critical infrastructure, would hit in the U.S. homeland. Uh, several years ago, the Senate Armed Services Committee published, somewhat to my surprise, unclassified, but did publish uh, uh, information that the Chinese government hackers had gotten into the networks of some 20 companies supporting U.S. Transportation Command. Why would they do that? I don't think I have to answer. <laughs> I don't think I have to answer that for this group. Um, second, some assets, particularly in outer space, uh, uh, as well as cyberspace, support both conventional and nuclear missions, and both theater and strategic missions. So both Russia and China have expressed concerns about U.S. missile defenses including about the European phase adaptive approach and about the U.S. deployment of THAAD uh, in South Korea. And they are perhaps more worried about missile defenses than I would judge, and I think many of us would judge, uh, justifiable today. But the reality is if they thought a conflict was imminent, um, there would be strong incentives on their part to go after our theater nuclear, I'm sorry, our theater missile defense capabilities and one of the most attractive ways to do that would be through cyberspace and outer space. So think about, um, I, I won't mention the specific systems. I think people here understand. Um, there are many terrestrial elements of uh, US command and control and long range strike uh, systems are dual use. Cyber attacks or space attacks that affected these systems have the potential uh, uh, to be to blur the distinction between conventional and nuclear, and of course, conventional prompt global strike capabilities have real potential to blur that distinction as well. Um, and uh, 
and I, th I think I've covered the basics then of, of the fire bricks. If you think about the third category of how things are changing in the problem definition, it's most broadly uh, uh, described as impacts on strategic stability. And I'm thinking for the, for the people who have studied this for many decades, thinking about first strike stability in particular. And that is, uh, uh, and that is this idea that US and Russia have accepted mutually assured destruction as the basis of their nuclear relationship for many decades, and US-China are emerging in that genre as well. Um, today, I believe the stability of the US-Russia and US-Chinese nuclear relationship is quite strong. No reasonable person on either side uh, could believe that there are strong incentives to go nuclear, particularly early, uh, and there, that there's any prospect of having something that uh, has sometimes been, been described as a splinted first strike capability. Um, if you look forward into what could happen that would change this, uh, uh, let me, again, uh, let me suggest four different, four different examples of what could go forward. And I think the analytic community could, uh, uh, would, be, would do the uh, policy community a service by thinking about more examples than I'll provide here. Uh, first scenario is familiar to people who have spent any time on this issue. It's the predominant scenario that the, both the Russians and Chinese have raised in track one discussions. And that is this idea that the United States will develop conventional prompt global strike capabilities. So think about uh, conventional warheads on an ICBM or, a, or an SLBM. Uh, and we'll use those to attack nuclear command and control and nuclear, uh, 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 nuclear platforms as well. So ICBM, submarines, and port, and so on. And then we'll use missile defenses to mop up. The fact that we have neither the, any conventional prompt global strike today, uh, nor missile defenses with anywhere near their capac that capacity to deal with that, makes that a problem for the future. And we can, uh, we can talk about how far-fetched that is today, but it will be uh, more plausible, not just, and not particularly US going against others, but Russia and China against the US as well. The fact that we've seen Russia taking some dramatic actions today because of concerns about their, uh, the survivability of their strategic nuclear deterrent should make us realize that they take this seriously today. Um, the so-called status six system, which is, a, which is uh, Russians have stated they have and the, and the recent nuclear posture review asserts is, is actually a system, is a great example or a horrible example, I should say. Uh, Nuclear-powered, multi-megaton megaton torpedo intended to uh, essentially take out the west coast of the United States through a combination of detonation, uh, radiation, uh, and tsunami. Okay, that seems future-oriented and a very difficult task uh, if you're the attacker. So a second scenario is that the attacker uses uh, cyber to hack into the other side's nuclear command and control so that they cannot launch their nuclear weapons. To me, it seems highly implausible that one could hold down the, uh, either US to others or them to us, could hold down an adversary's nuclear command and control system for a long period, let alone indefinitely. The question is whether one could do so long enough to preclude the other side from giving orders to make their forces more survivable uh, and from uh, the capacity to launch their ICBMs under attack. That doesn't require as much time. It's not an easy do, there's no question. But again, you then get back into scenario one, which is uh, after the hack to cause their for forces to pause, to then go after them with a range of conventional uh, s systems and, and defend with missile defenses. A third related scenario, and I'll go quicker here, use cyber to cause their uh, nuclear platforms uh, to light up as so as beacons instead of instead of, uh, uh, instead of t uh, them being opaque or, or, or difficult to find. And an interesting approach to anti-submarine warfare or air defense. And a fourth scenario, that this is one that I do worry, worry about, uh, not about today, but about the future. Um, and that is um, each side has uh, the ability to leverage incredible work going on in big data analytics, uh, in AI, uh, and combine that with the proliferation of sensors 
And as you look at that work that's underway in the private sector that could be exploited uh, in the military sphere, the question is, um, will the currently most survivable systems for the US and for Russia and China be confidently highly survivable a couple decades into the future? So big data analytics has been described as finding a needle in the haystack. So I'm talking about finding nuclear needles in multiple haystacks, finding submarines at sea, finding mobile missiles in the field. Um, uh, this is what big data analytics is all about. Um, and if it becomes possible, it's obviously a game changer for strategic stability. These scenarios are a few examples. Um, for those who are wondering, they're all examples that, uh, that were explicitly cleared uh, by the Pentagon in, in, in security review. It's, they're, not a, they're not intended to be proposals for what we should do or descriptions of what we are doing or others are doing, uh, but examples that people who are thinking about this problem set might start with uh, and might begin to develop the basis not just for our own analysis but for uh, discussions with the Russians and Chinese in particular in the future. So, so to summarize before I get to, before I get to some, some recommendations, um, uh, the bad news is that we're, because of the uh, exploitation of emerging technologies by Russia and China and by the US, all of which are valid for conventional war fighting, we're going to see a likely increase in the potential for slippery slopes of escalation, for the erosion of fire, break, fire breaks between conventional and nuclear and between theater and strategic war fighting, and uh, over time a reduction in strategic stability unless we take some steps to deal with it. The good news is that there are a lot of steps to be taken and there's time before these problems are likely to become immediately pressing. And so I'd like to talk about some of those steps next and offer 11 recommendations out of a set of many more. Um, and I, Brad, what I think I'll do is we'll, we'll set a time to stop and I'll go, through, I'll go through the recommendations, a few in detail, and then I'll be prepared to give you other highlights in defer those to Q&A. And if you don't, then, uh, if you don't mind, uh, give me a target time and I'll, I'll hit it. Should we, 11, 1120, perfect, okay. Okay, recommendation number one, the US should reaffirm mutual vulnerability or mutual assured destruction uh, as the basis for strategic stability vis-a-vis -vis Russia. And the US should accept that publicly with respect to the PRC. Um, the fact is that we are stuck with MAD vis-a-vis -vis Russia, and that's been acknowledged by multiple administrations. Uh, and while China has many fewer weapons than Russia, it also has a different standard for MAD vis-a-vis -vis the United States than Russia. Uh, and uh, I, I believe we've been emerging into that world uh, for some time, and I think it would, be, uh, it would be helpful for us to acknowledge that reality is a matter of, of, of policy. Uh, and, there, and what that says is that we recognize that neither side has the realistic prospect of undertaking actions that could negate the other side's ability to impose unacceptable damage in a second strike. Um, we can unpack that more in Q&A. But yes, missile defenses will improve. Yes, conventional systems, cyber and space will come in. But there's no prospect of having what sometimes has been called in the past splinted first strike capabilities. So that means that you want to take steps to reinforce stability based on so-called mutual vulnerability. Not mutual vulnerability of forces, but mutual vulnerability of economies, societies. After acknowledging this reality, we can think about what steps we need to take to reinforce stability. And I'll offer a few, but if we look in the rear view mirror, the United States has taken so many steps in the past. Um, I mentioned dispersing of bombers, based on the Wolstetter study, hardening of ICBMs, uh, the investing in SSBNs, by far the most expensive way uh, to deploy nuclear weapons, but because it's survivable. Even if you go uh, into more recent history, the demerving of ICBMs, the Minuteman III ICBMs, from three warheads to one, it had multiple justifications, but the principal strategic one was make it less threatening as, a, uh, as an offensive uh, capability and make it less attractive as a target. Okay, um, 
we've foregone capabilities in the past as well as spending money to achieve capabilities. In the 80s, the US, after a successful test of the F-15 miniature homing vehicle and a satellite weapon, stopped it. Turned out the administration and the Congress disagreed. Congress had the power of the purse and that program was stopped. You can argue whether it was the right choice, but it was based on stability grounds. Um, uh, when uh, Brad and Michael uh, were in the Department of Defense, there was a choice uh, uh, before Secretary Gates of whether to go forward with the conventional Trident modification, um, basically putting highly accurate conventional warheads on the front end of a D-5 missile. Um, Gates um, rejected that, and, that option, although it was the quickest way to get to prompt global strike and the least costly way to get to prompt global strike, he rejected it explicitly on stability grounds because of the risk of not just of overflight, but that a launch would be mistaken as a first move uh, for a nuclear attack. We can talk about missile defenses from ABM Treaty uh, on, and it's, uh, and it's important that multiple administrations, both Republican and Democrat, have have explicitly stated that their aims on missile defense are limited. Uh, and they're not intending to undermine strategic stability. Uh, and it applies also to arms control negotiations, going back to the day when the US in SALT and uh, START negotiations attempted to limit the number of Russian SS-18s and other so-called heavy ICBMs. OK, so th that's thing one is accept the reality that we are in uh, for the indefinite future and look to take steps to reinforce uh, the strategic stability vis-a-vis -vis Russia and China based on that. Uh, second, uh, the U.S. should adopt uh, what I call a triad, for, a triad plus strategic force posture. The diverse triad with ICBMs, SLBMs, and heavy bombers is still a good, uh, is still a good starting place. Uh, and, uh, but the reality is that given that we put so many of the eggs in the SSBN basket of our strategic capabilities, I believe we need to hedge in two distinct ways. Um, the first uh, I've written about with uh, retired Admiral Sandy Winnefeld, and uh, perhaps by coincidence, this administration has, has decided to take this chance, and that's going back toward an um, SSN, in other words, attack submarine-based nuclear-tipped cruise missile. It would be different from the TLAM N. Uh, it, would be, uh, it needs to be more survivable. It, 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 there are other steps that need to be taken. It's not an immediate uh, capability, but I would, take that, I would recommend taking that step both to reinforce extended deterrence, which we haven't talked about in this talk, but also as a hedge uh, against advances in ASW. And you could say, hey, Miller, just a second. I thought you just said that you're worried about uh, that, you know, why you have submarine-based capabilities if you're worried about ASW. And that the answer is that to a significant degree for most avenues of anti-submarine warfare, numbers really matter. And the ability to go from maximum 12 with the Columbia class SSBNs to add another 44 plus uh, uh, platforms at sea available for deployment makes the numbers a lot harder for an adversary. Um, second, uh, in, this, in this category uh, of boosting our hedge against future SSBN vulnerability, recommend going forward, not with an ICBM that exactly replaces the Minuteman III, with the capacity to have three warheads and to, as well as the uh, countermeasures and so forth, but to go forward with a, a light ICBM, something more along the lines of what used to be called the small ICBM or Midget Man, um, uh, and to deploy a few hundred in silos because having some in silos makes sense, uh, and to have an, a mobile research and development program including uh, the development of prototypes so that if there are indicators that the strategic submarines are becoming vulnerable um, or if they're and, and they may be they may not be uh, compelling indicators but if there's if there is deemed to be a substantial probability then we have another hedge it's so be explicit on this more important to have diversity in the uh, potential vulnerabilities of our nuclear forces in my view than to have more numbers. Numbers is one, are one way to hedge. Diversity of how an attacker would have to go after them is second. Um, okay, uh, national missile defenses, number three. We should increase our defenses sufficiently 
to stay ahead of North Korea, which is and obviously an increasing threat and challenge. But we should make clear that we are not attempting to develop a system that would uh, de uh, defeat either Russian or Chinese strategic missiles. I spent a lot of my five years in the Obama administration trying to convince the Russians and, and the Chinese that our missile defenses were not, uh, that, our, that our strategic missile defenses were not aimed at them. It's pretty easy right now. You've got 44 <laughs> ground-based interceptors. Uh, now this administration is, has already decided to boost it to 60 with 20 more ground-based interceptors at Fort Greeley. At that number, at that level, you're talking about the, about the same number of interceptors that Russia has in the, its Moscow ABM system. The Russian Moscow ABM system has nuclear-tipped interceptors specifically oriented to going after um, uh, strategic missiles, U.S. And, and, and presumably also French or British. So that hasn't worried us. And uh, deployments at the level of 64, for that matter, 104, if an East Coast missile field is put in place, or 124, are not going to fundamentally affect strategic stability. Two things may. And this is something we need to wrap our arms around. Um, thing one that may affect strategic stability on missile defenses is the deployment of large numbers of moderately capable uh, interceptors. For us, uh, the entry level, uh, the minimal entry level is the SM-32A. Uh, for the Russians, it's the S-500. Uh, and the issue is not interceptors in Romania or this year in Poland. The issue is whether interceptors deployed elsewhere close to the United States would have the, the capability to engage uh, ICBMs. There are a lot of technical reasons to think that that's a heck of a hard challenge. Uh, and in addition to the countermeasures and volume and defense suppression uh, and other attack, you have other attack modes as well. The, the, the likelihood that the United States deploys effective uh, continental air defense is pretty close to zero. So I think stability can be robust with significant numbers, but it's something that we need to think about and we need to have a conversation with the Russians and Chinese about. Over a longer period of time, directed energy is, uh, you guys would know better, guys and gals would know better. Uh, looks like it's coming into something real uh, in, the, in the coming couple of decades. Uh, certainly at the tactical level today, but at the strategic level potentially within that time frame. Okay, so boost missile defenses to deal with North Korea by ourselves, protection and time. Um, make it clear that we don't wish to affect strategic stability and work through the issues uh, with respect to both where we go on in numbers and capability for other land-based interceptors. Um, fourth, to me this means uh, very directly and explicitly the United States should not deploy space-based kinetic interceptors. The United States should not deploy space-based directed energy systems either. And we should seek the explicit agreement of Russia and China also not to do so. These systems would be, um, to whatever degree they're capable for missile defense, they would be far more capable as anti-satellite weapons. And I've never seen a, a, a clear description of how you can have stability uh, aside from when these systems are deployed unless one side has dominance. I don't believe Russia or China would accept our dominance of even solely uh, uh, low Earth orbit with these capabilities. So these systems would be an inviting uh, target for first strike uh, early, in a cri early in a conflict or potentially even in a crisis. The United States could not gain, uh, tolerate either Russia or Ch China gaining the high ground, again, even if only low Earth orbit. Um, and uh, uh, they couldn't tolerate that for us uh, either. Um, I think that putting interceptors in outer space or directed energy in outer space is an invitation for a Cuban missile crisis in outer space. Okay, number five. We need to find the sweet spot for the deployment of advanced conventional systems, including uh, systems that fall in the category of prompt global strike. The U.S., the Russians, and the Chinese are all working on hypersonic cruise missiles and on long-range uh, ballistic missiles, including those, uh, those with boost glide on the front end. Uh, and these prompt global strike capabilities would be handy for going after a terrorist, 
uh, or they'd be hand, handy about for going after cap certain capabilities of a small state, a uh, uh, so-called uh, rogue nation, for example. They could also be seen as handy for going after critical targets of another major power. And that's where the stability issue comes in, um, as I've talked about before. And so the United States has already decided, at least for the present, not to go forward with the most cost-effective near-term conventional prompt global strike system. So what should it do uh, going forward? Um, so where is, this, where is the sweet spot for hypersonics? Let me give you some parameters, and, you can, and I think you can think about these as uh, broadly as policy, but also to some degree as design parameters. One, militarily effective in a range of scenarios. Two, because of that desire of, of low enough costs that you can envision procuring them in relatively significant volume against, for use against tactical or operational targets, uh, which will mean less than global range and less impact on strategic stability. And for me, that means things like a conventional ICBM or a conventional Trident modification uh, should remain off the table, short, medium range, intermediate range, hypersonics, uh, cruiser and or ballistic should be on the table for deployment. And I believe that they can uh, be put in place in a way that would not undermine strategic stability vis-a-vis U.S., Russia, or U.S., China. Number six, um, United States needs to define its preferred rules of the road for cyberspace and for outer space, not only in peacetime where there's been interesting and, and, and thoughtful work done, but in crisis and conflict. Uh, and then uh, the United States needs to articulate those views to allies and partners and, and to potential adversaries, and then needs to consider whether there's room for common ground and common understanding, not just of each other's views, but of what those rules of the road are. So there are a lot of questions to be answered. Let me give one for cyberspace and one for outer space. Um, first, is it legitimate for one side to put destructive implants in the critical infrastructure of the other side? Uh, for its military, okay, that's one thing. For its civilian critical infrastructure, maybe another thing. There have been uh, public reports that Russia has inserted malware in the U.S. energy grid. Um, there's no doubt that Russia has used cyber uh, uh, as a tool, not just of information and disinformation, but to go after, for example, the Ukrainian grid with a uh, black energy tool. So that's, that's one set of questions for cyberspace. There are more. Turning to outer space, is it legitimate for one side to maneuver a satellite in close proximity to the other side's satellite? OK. If so, you need to, you need to take that on board. If not, um, how far away is acceptable? What actions do we think are legitimate to enforce any keep out zone? Um, again, thing, the first thing here is to sort out US views and policy and approach. Second is to work to get our allies and partners on board. Third is to articulate those approaches to our potential adversaries. And fourth is to have a conversation about common rules of the road and so on. I think we need to get this sequencing right, and it starts with getting our own views uh, in order. Um, I think uh, number seven, I'm gonna, I'm gonna list and skip an explanation because it's fairly self-evident. The US needs to address any vulnerabilities in its nuclear command and control system. Uh, and I'll add to that, I, I, uh, and maybe I will say a word about this one, the US should continue to work to move away from any reliance on launch under attack for ICBMs. Um, the first proposition is straightforward. You want secure nuclear command and control. You want it not just for a nuclear or conventional attack, but for cyberspace. That's, I think that, that, that requires no further explanation. Um, today, in my estimation, the most important view, uh, the most important role of US ICBMs, not the only role, but the most important role, is to serve as a hedge in the event that we have problems with the SSBN slash SLBM leg of the triad. We have most of our uh, long range or strategic nuclear capabilities in the C base leg. We have highly capable systems with the D5, W88, indeed the W76 warheads. Um, um, ICBMs can have a, certainly have a role, but their most important role is if we have a problem with the C base leg. And uh, hedging in a different way that in, rather than having to rely on launch under attack, 
but to be prepared to go to mobile ICBMs, uh, uh, to me, is a much better way to hedge uh, than, uh, than, than our current posture. Okay, uh, the Department of Defense should enhance, I'm sorry, should prioritize enhancements of cyber and space resilience for critical military capabilities. And here, for details, I refer you to our Defense Science Board report on cyber deterrence. Bumper sticker is work on resilience for nuclear because you don't want to undermine stability directly. Second, work on resilience associated with critical conventional capabilities. I'm thinking of things like the B-21 bomber with JASM ER. Sorry if that's a, it's a um, I won't spell out the acronym, but, but a, a stealthy missile for conventional strike. Thinking about things like SSNs with, with Tomahawk conventional missiles for long range strike. Uh, and third category, which is perhaps the most challenging, is to have highly, some highly resilient offensive cyber capability. So that if we are hit hard with offensive cyber, offensive cyber is one of the arrows in the quiver to respond as well as conventional. Uh, and I, uh, I, I would associate myself with the remarks of the vice chairman a couple of days ago, uh, 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 Paul Selva, who went out and said uh, that he didn't and the department did not see nuclear weapons as, uh, as a vital or appropriate tool uh, for our cyber deterrence posture. Okay. Uh, number nine, uh, the U.S. needs to take dramatic action to reduce the vulnerability that, uh, of its critical, of the most vital parts of its critical infrastructure to cyber attack. That is hard. It, um, there's some progress. Uh, in my estimation, we are, as a country, becoming more vulnerable, not less vulnerable with time. Uh, but I'm talking about not a complete fix, but focus on the electrical grid, focus on the financial sector, water and wastewater, or electoral system. You might want to add one or two things. Uh, but uh, I think, uh, I, I really believe that uh, it's possible to make fundamental change in a 10 to 20 year time frame. It's not going to happen quickly. We're, we're shooting behind the target here. Uh, U.S. should, number 10, I'll just list the last couple. Uh, number 10, the U.S. should sustain our current arms control agreement, uh, new start with Russia. Uh, um, we need to take action. And, and I think we need to take somewhat more action than we've taken to date in, in response to Russian cheating on INF. I would not link those two. Um, uh, and I'll, 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 I'll stop there. I'm glad to talk about the JCPOA or North Korea nuclear diplomacy, which is challenging to say the least, uh, in the Q&A. Uh, and 11th and, and not least important, but uh, uh, by any stretch, is that the United States should continue to rebuild its military and diplomatic discussions on stability issues with Russia. First, get our own thinking in order, of course, uh, and also strengthen them with China. We should prepare for substantive strategic stability talks. It, the, I know a number of people uh, in this room are involved in Track 1.5 and Track 2 discussions. At this point in time, I actually believe that Track 1.5 and Track 2 are more important than Track one discussions, other government to government discussions on these stability issues, because um, I don't believe the United States government yet has sorted out its own views. And I think it's unhelpful if one team comes uh, uh, at, you know, in, uh, in January to talk to the Russians or Chinese and says A, another team comes in February and says B, or if it changes even by administration. Let's get that work done. I think that the informal. Uh, uh, discussions in track 1.5 and 2 are fundamental to that. Okay, um, if I can, I'll take one more minute to conclude, Brad. Um, going back to the you know, history of this great institution and of the other labs uh, to the you know, beginning of the nuclear age, essentially, um, Albert Einstein famously said that the splitting of the atom has changed everything except the way that we think. Um, following World War II, there was a flurry of obviously a flurry of activity, um, which I will not <laughs> rehearse at this point in time, but our way of thinking did change over time. Um, I mentioned one, you know, one of many, many examples, and, and uh, there are people in the room, and you know, Michael, I certainly include you, and, and Ron, just among, and Brad, among the people I know who over, over a period of decades uh, were part of that 
advancement and part of that uh, discussion and debate. We spent trillions of dollars to get survivable delivery systems over time. We're going to do it again. We spent hundreds of billions of dollars for survivable command and control. We work crazy to do that. We are smart to do it. The challenge is we're facing a more diverse set of potential both challenges, uh, challenges for strategic stability, for the erosion of fire breaks, and for slippery slopes than we've had in the past. And even at the same time, we know we need to pursue many of these capabilities for non-nuclear war fighting. So it's going it's to, it's, we're going to have to change our way of thinking a little, and we're going to have to learn a little bit more. I think that the, what I've suggested today is really a, the, a, a small tip of an iceberg. I know that there's other work going on here. Uh, there's work that Michael had started before he even came into the Pentagon and pursued there and has continued, uh, sometimes under the uh, umbrella of multi-domain deterrence. There's, a, there's important work to be done. Uh, and uh, the people here in the room and the lab more broadly, I believe, have a, uh, and the labs, uh, along with places like the Applied Physics Lab and elsewhere, where there are true expertise and technology and the ability to do both unclassified and classified work uh, and to take lessons from technology into policy and vice versa, have a fundamental role in a way that we, in a sense, we haven't seen since the early days of the nuclear age. And so I say, um, thank you for the opportunity to speak today, welcome your questions, and thank you for what you're uh, doing here at the lab.